unlike many other sports, let's say that there is a you know new tennis court being built in in your city. Typically, it's being built by a contractor, like not really a tennis club, because you know it's a little different thing. Uh, but what I've learned in this call is that whether you're in Finland, Sweden, Germany, or United States, the local community, I mean, players are very important part of the success of the, the new course build up. I mean, they can help with the tee pads, they can help with the baskets and tee signs and clearing the course. Of course, we need to make sure that everything is done safely. So mm -hmm. it's pretty cool to see that, the, that actually when there is a new course coming into the city or town, it actually gathers the acti activity and, and community together. And that mm -hmm. will actually be a very good base and foundation for the for the course and, and activities around it. Hello everyone and welcome to another episode of Approachable brought to you by Jomez Pro. I'm Joe Henderson. And I'm Paige Pierce. And Joe, before we get into this episode, I just want to know what you're doing up there in Canada, what's been going on, and you know, what am I missing out on? I need to get up to BC. Yes, you do. I am currently just working. I'm working a couple jobs right now and just kind of trying to stay warm. It's been a little bit chilly here in Canada. It has dropped below probably that 20 degree mark, minus 20 degree mark, I should clarify, um, Celsius for probably <laughs> about like, I don't know, for about two months. So there has been very limited disc golf. I try to bundle up putt when I can and go play courses when I can, but it's pretty pretty dang cold out there but yeah how about you Paige what's been going on I have been doing lots of stuff and getting ready for you to get here too which is awesome yes I can't wait so to visit. the next couple we might have a recording with both of us in the same booth that'll be fun but yeah yes. it's been crazy you know you're talking about it being cold and I feel like that's kind of like our main topic of conversation in the winter right when we're all just itching yeah. to go play disc golf and yeah. you know everywhere is experiencing cold on their own level and everyone's cold even if it's negative 20 or 30 degrees you know the people in <laughs> yeah. those areas are cold too cold to play so I guess that's something that um I want to ask our listeners like what do you do in the off season to keep playing to keep the the addiction level going right of disc golf but you're inside so i see exactly. i see lots of people bring the basket inside i saw paul mcbeth put like a mattress up an air mattress behind yes, his basket I love that. and he was practice putting i know yeah. like brody and brian Earhart have these uh like nets like baseball nets that they bring inside right. uh, missy actually has one too and we'll probably yeah. I don't know if I want to do that in the new house, you know, play disc golf in the new right? house. Right, yeah. It's like, for me, you don't want to damage any walls I'm, or anything like that. Uh, yeah. But <laughs> I feel sure. I feel fortunate to be somewhere where it's not super cold. Um, but yeah, I've just yeah. been enjoying I'm, Florida and, and enjoying uh, taking it easy before the season starts. So this is going to be a season to remember and... I know 2022 is going to bring you guys lots of excitement. So I think today talking to S Simon and UC, you know, you probably have heard both of their names before, but I don't think that you guys have heard anything like what we're about to start talking to them about because we are going to not ask them about Dismania, not ask them about, you know, trick shots or YouTube videos. <laughs> we are going to be talking to Simon and UC about Disc Golf Park and their initiatives to get disc golf, uh, to, to grow disc golf through implementing more and more courses all over the world. So I'm excited to see what goes into all of that. I mean, to put in, I mean, hundreds and hundreds of courses, like I'm excited to hear what that business is like and hopefully they give us some advice if what we can do to get some courses into our areas. Exactly. I want to know how can I, as a local disc golf player, how can I implement Disc Golf Park and what are the steps that I need to do to take that on? And yeah, I think it's going to be cool to hear the course design aspect as well. I know my brother has uh, designed a couple of courses and it's interesting watching his brain work and how, how things, um, yeah, just how he designs a course and what does he think is a good course. 
And I'm, and I'm excited to hear what Simon's idea of a good course is and UC's and just all the people that they have behind them, backing them up on this. Totally. So let's get into it. Let's bring them on and you are listening to Approachable. Here we go. And we have here Simon Lazat and UC. Hello, everyone. How are you guys? Doing great. Thank you. Perfect. Thank you for the invitation. So glad to have you guys on. We just wanted to hop on here and just kind of chat a little bit about your history with Disc Golf Park. And we want to know kind of, first off, maybe you could just generalize it and let us know who you are and what is Disc Golf Park and how are you involved? Well, I can start because I'm the I'm the guy who basically brought <laughs> it up. Uh, the Disc Golf Park is a turnkey solution for Disc Golf course in, in very short. But basically, it's a fully customizable project pretty much in any space or land area for disc golf. And probably we're going to talk much more about that later in this show. And my name is Jussi Meresma. I'm actually the founder of the Disc Golf Park. I also, I'm the founder of the Disc Mania, which is now basically an owner of the Disc Golf Park concept. So we're all tied together. And that's that's basically what we are. Disc Golf Park is something that is so important to our sport from my opinion because we always talk about growing the sport growing the sport how do we grow the sport and that is to get disc golf in front of more people and with more courses all over the world that is how we do that when people see the random basket and they're like what's that you know it's saying disc golf park in the big font on the basket and being able to uh, have the bulletin boards telling you what disc golf is. I think that is such an important part. So Simon, what is your role with disc golf park? And, you know, yeah. What, when do you go out to a course and give it the Simon Lazat stamp of approval? Yeah, I've been working with UC, of course, most of my disc golf career starting in 2008 out of the top of my head. I don't know when exactly he found a disc golf park. But obviously, working with UC, I want to be a part of all of, his, all of his endeavors. And I, my first introduction to Disc Golf Park was probably in Germany when we, when we went to a, a sporting convention in Cologne. Uh, that was my first <laughs> approach to like the whole business side of Disc Golf as well, which was a bit overwhelming for me. But no, as of recently, I've been uh, walking around some of the woods here in New England with Avery Jenkins, who is a disc golf park designer and the disc golf world champion, of course. Um, just kind of tapping my feet into the world of course design, which is pretty, it, it's like a very nice avenue for maybe retired pros um, to go with staying involved with the sport and growing the sport. and like putting your stamp on a course is like one of the coolest feelings. And I can't wait for, for me to have like that, that feeling first. Awesome. So actually that is part of one of the questions I wanted to ask today is about conventions. You kind of mentioned that there, Simon. I think that it's so interesting because the general public of disc golf has no idea that you guys even go to conventions. So tell us as Tell this audience, like, what does a convention look like? How do you get involved with the conventions? And then what do you do when you're there? You kind of, I've seen on Instagram, y'all's booths set up. And so you kind of talk to that community about getting more courses or what, it, what do you do there, you see? Well, <clears throat> that's a good question. Uh, I would probably outline this that, uh, first of all, the Disc Golf Park as a concept was established in 2005 so it's already more than 15 years old and and that time I was basically kind of investigating how disc golf is actually born in local areas and what what happens when disc golf is coming to town or or anywhere and there is basically I found that the main thing is that there is a local community I mean there is a one or two or group of players disc golfers who wants to have a course you know, right where they live. And then they started to, you know, push that to the community and they go to the, you know, parks and parks and recreational manager or whoever on that, that city to talk about it. And that is basically the normal way that disc golf has been since the, you know, seventies and eighties. <clears throat> uh, I tried to 
kind of find a more professional way how we can approach it actually from a different angle. So that's why we found these conventions like park and rec shows. Of course, there is multiple uh, different shows in Finland, Sweden, Germany, and U.S. And then we started to actually go to them because first, I mean, 2005, six, seven, when we were there first couple times, it was basically just educate, educating people and the communities and city people about disc golf. And that's where we started to build our disc golf park uh, concept. So those conventions are very important because that gives a different angle because if I, as an individual, I want to make a, you know, a motion that, okay, let's, let's have a disc golf course in, in my area. I'm just the one person and one individual. Of course, there could be more, but when there is another group of, you know, in this case, our company contacting these same city people on the different direction in convention where actually they are there for the free will finding new ideas that is more powerful. Yeah. So when you're at that convention, like what is, do more people come up to you or are you kind of like, Hey, come on over here check out disc golf. Like what, and who are you talking to? Like, are you talking to city representatives or like what, what type of people are at those conventions? Like who are you pitching disc golf to there? Yeah, I mean, overall, you could say they they are city people. Of course, you need to pick and choose the right conventions to go. So, for example, in the United States, there is this national park and rec show that is always, I mean, different, you know, place in, in your country. And that is one time a year. But, of course, we have different shows in Sweden, Finland and Germany where we go. And those shows, they gather, obviously, people under that umbrella so let's say that's a park and rec show then there are people who are of course responsible for the park and rec activities in their city town or village i mean there is no like a, a, there are all kind of people but of yeah. course there are also other companies and and then some of those shows they can also have individual people who are just looking for ideas so there are many type of shows but the basically it's we call it business to business, B to B people that we're talking to. So we're not talking and trying to sell our idea to the individual, but a city personal. Okay. And maybe Simon, you can answer when you visited our booth at the Cologne trade show, which is actually the biggest European trade show in our industry. And there was, of course, a lot of other sports. I mean, there is a huge uh, halls of football, artificial turf, spas outdoor activities so how did you see disc golf being there presented compared for example tennis paddle whatever it it was absolutely mind-blowing to me the experience like that was the first time that i really saw and realized like disc golf this is like a real business because for me growing up in germany disc golf was super not serious in any way it had nothing to do with business for me and I don't remember what year I went. I want to say it was 2012 or 13-ish in that area. Um, so that was before I even started touring or being a professional disc golfer. Um, and the people that were walking around there, like people in suits, absolute businessmen, which in my <laughs> life at that time, I, I, I couldn't relate to people in suits at all. I was like a hippie kid <laughs> throwing frisbees in the park. And I was supposed to talk to them like, hey, check this out. We're disc golfers. Um, we had our proper outfits on the booth looked amazing like super professional that goes along with what you see and Discmania has always done pretty much before anyone else was making it look legit and professional and that really impressed me I noticed quickly that it wasn't my cup of tea to go there and talk to people <laughs> in suits about trying to sell them what disc golf is and having like selling disc golf to someone in a suit was not my style but it was very, definitely a good experience. And cool. that's what yeah. that's what you see in the teams for. I know you work with Dana yeah. Vici as well. And, um, you know, a few others are on the convention type board. But that's why you, Simon, are kind of in a different role of helping Avery with the course design and dipping your foot in there, like you're saying, and trying to get, uh, you know, different opinions of great players to make not only disc golf park look professional at conventions, but also the level of, of course also be top notch. I mean, we've seen this time and time again, we know one of the, 
probably the most prestigious event is the European Open and those courses. Everybody wants to play the European Open, one for the crowd, but a lot of it is because of the beast, the course that you've put in there, you see, and, you know, that has now uh, spiraled uphill towards the Tempere. Is, am I saying that right? Tempere? Tempere. More or less? Yep. Okay. The Tempere Disc Golf Center. Um, these courses are so, like, fantasized about over here that all the Americans want to get over there. And so I'm curious on what the numbers of courses you guys have are, if you have the numbers in Europe versus America, and then just how many total courses you, you all have put in and what your plans are moving forward. Do you have a bunch on the books? Yeah. I want to touch back to that last question that one reason yeah, I it, wanted it, Simon, it, to, Simon to go to the trade show is that he would also see that side of the business because I mean, typically me and him, we, we meet at the disc golf courses or, or tournaments. So it's totally different world there. Yeah. And of course, uh, you know, we feel that the disc mania and, and pretty much all the disc golf companies at the moment are like a promotional companies for the sport. They are not really here just to make, you know, money and, and try to get as much as much in as possible. We, we all have a big mission to grow the sport and make it bigger and better. So, and that's why we, we established the disc golf park. I mean, if you think the name disc golf park, we wanted to create a multinational name that kind of relates what it is like, you know, skate parks, if we talk about the skate park, you know that, okay, you can imagine that there are different types of skate parks, but it's basically the same thing that you can mm -hmm. go there and, you know, skate, you can do roller plating or maybe scooting now in that place that so it's kind of an area for a certain activity. And that's what the disc golf park is. It's, it's for the disc golf. And, and of course, it's a kind of a still a multi we are still in a very much multi-use parks all over the world. So there are not too many like very, you know, uh, closed disc golf courses that are pay to play. Of course, there are some of them, but less than 10 persons, I would say mm -hmm. all over. And going back to, or now to your question about the, the numbers that I think that at the moment, I mean, when I started disc golf in Finland back in the 1994, uh, and uh, I, I think there was five courses five disc golf courses in Finland. And then about 10 years after that, when we created the disc golf park concept, we started to push the, you know, the idea was that, okay, if we want more people to play or even have an access to play this sport, we need more courses. I mean, you can't really play basketball if you don't have the hoops and the court. So right. you need to have that disc golf course. And we wanted to take this professional a kind of approach that okay we want to start selling from kind of a from the top to bottom so we didn't want to go to the local route we wanted to move more like an international convention route and today i think that our disc golf park uh, first of all we have like designers all over the world so if people are interested of you know pushing the sport and want to design disc golf courses they don't need to l learn everything and try to figure out where i get the baskets or other course equipment they can contact us and we will train them and we will teach them to do these things so they can be part of the disco park family or designer family. I think we have like around 40 people around the world. And oh, nowadays, wow. now, now wow. in 2022, we are probably a little over 900 disc golf courses in Finland. So from five courses to 900 in this, you know, wow. 20, 20 years, almost yeah. 30 years. Yeah, That's but incredible. it is kind of... A, it, it is an amazing and it's not like it's just me there designing courses. I haven't actually designed many courses in the last couple of years. There are people who are out there every week. So our most busiest designers, they po probably get like up to 25 projects a year. And the whole disc golf park, I would say we annually, we do around 200 projects. So wow. basically we can always say that there is a disc, new disc golf park born every 48 hours in wow. average. That's amazing. That is that's truly so amazing. Cool. And, you know, that's just like a huge stat to show 
to show people outside the sport how much disc golf's growing is to just say those numbers like how, how impressive is that and i actually had no idea until this moment right now that you guys had 40 plus people on staff uh, are they i guess they're not ne necessarily on staff it's kind of like contract work in a way yeah yeah, yeah. I, I think that we have three to five full-time people Okay. And the rest are kind of an independent contractors because, of course, we, we don't have an offices all, all these countries, but they can join our network and, and then we can start working together. Okay. And then if Simon, if you're nearby, some one of those people, he can you can go over there and kind of be like, oh, I think we should move this basket here or something like that. Well, I think yes, I think everyone. Yes. <laughs> everyone that has played a lot of disc golf, played a, a ton of courses like I have. I've traveled around the world, of course, playing hundreds of courses. Um, we all have our opinions on certain courses. Whenever we get to a course, it's super easy to like complain about this or the layout or whatever it is. We always have something like, oh, I would have done this better or that. Everyone has like their own things that they like and don't like. Um, what I've experienced in my couple of times I've went out is, but when you get, when you get a, like a plot of land that is fresh and has of course nothing done to it and they say here build us make design a disc golf course here it's a lot more intimidating and difficult than i thought so it was a good lesson to like not always just complain about disc golf courses that or i think oh i would have made a way better course in this property because it's not that easy <laughs> i could imagine it being difficult so i applaud you guys for putting in 200 courses a year that sounds like a huge workload um Definitely. yeah i I just, I didn't really realize that it was to that capacity. And so I'm, I'm assuming that's going to be the case in 2022 as well. You guys aren't slowing down by any means. The sport is taking off. So what, what does this year look like for you? How, how booked out and like, what is your time frame to when someone puts in a request for disc golf park to help them get a course in, how, how long does that take? Well, that's that's the question of where this is going to be. So, of course, we have most of our designers are in Europe and U.S. So those are the countries that we can probably facilitate the, the growth the best. But there is a lot of interest now in, you know, central to southern Europe. And then we need to figure out, OK, who's going to travel there and when we're going to do it. And of course, now during the pandemic and travel restrictions, there is not really much travel. So we need to take care of things locally as, as good mm -hmm. as we can. And uh, now when we are in the middle of the off season and, you know, it's a winter time here and also up north in Boston area, the course designs is actually not really active now. But whenever the snow melts, let's say come March, April, May, our all our designers are fully booked pretty much. And, and this is, of course, because of the huge growth of the sport. And now and I, what I have learned is that, I mean, when when the pandemic hit almost two years ago after that first couple of months everybody started to play more so it's easy to start playing more when you can go out and play but all the cities and and and, and towns they actually are one to two years behind that curve because of course you can't just buy the course next day when you see that okay there's a lot of right. player now so they always react slower so now we're actually last year 2021 we started to see the the, the ramp up of you know course demand on the city level because they kind of uh, got the experience of 2020 that okay we need to do something we have one course in town but it's fully fully booked and we need to have another one so they're always coming like at least one year later because they also have their budgets so you can't really fit everything into the budget now you need to wait until the next budget or whatever the, the reason is so i'm pretty confident that we will see at least a couple next years a big growth on course demand awesome wow uh i have a question for you you see i was just wondering if a local community is looking to expand their courses and wants to reach out to disc golf park how would they do that and how would they access your services well, we, we try to act global in a way that, okay, we have a disc golf park website, discgolfpark.com, that people can find. Of course, most of the people, they go to Google or then they go to their friends asking, okay, how we can get into this disc golf thing. And our philosophy at the disc golf park is that we offer turnkey solutions. So when we you know work with the community or city, 
we 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 want to make sure that every every aspect is taken care of and of course one of the main main aspect is the safe and fun course design and and that is always adjusted to the land area the plot that it's in use because there are way different places that we can put the disc golf park i mean we have done a lot of disc golf parks in the small areas close to the schoolyard that is the totally different thing than Tampere Disc Golf Center, mm-hmm. which would be the, you know, the world-class course. So that's a huge variety that that can be done. And that's the beauty of the disc golf. We can design it pretty much anywhere. But basically, you need to find us online. I mean, we are still a very small organization in, in that matter. And then disc golf courses and disc golf park search words, and you will find us there. And of course, then... We will try to get you the, the nearest representative who will take care of you. That's so cool. So like go- globally, by the sense of like anywhere in the world could access this then? Yes, we have designed courses <clears throat> from Australia to the U.S., so everywhere. Incredible. Amazing. That's wonderful. I think one of my favorite projects that you guys have done just because of the sheer mass of it was your projects in the Oland islands. Um, and I saw on your Instagram or Facebook or something, you see that disc golf park is putting in 16 courses on these islands. And I mean, that's not just an all at the same time, right? It's like, it's not like they did 200 courses over 20 years or 900 courses in 20 years. Like you're saying, like they were like, Hey, we see the value. We want 16 courses. I'm curious to hear, did they kind of give you uh, their thoughts on why they were going from zero to a hundred or like, why did they tackle such a big project? Not that I'm complaining. I think it's amazing, but I'm just so shocked and impressed that you guys turned that around so quickly and how big of a success it's been. Yes, I mean, All and Project was 2020 when, when pretty much a couple months after the coronavirus hit hit Finland also. And All and Islands is a kind of an independent area between Sweden and Finland. And as, as, as said, there are islands. And, and there was this guy called Mats, and he he was he contacted our people in Sweden because Mats speaks Swedish. He doesn't speak Finnish, so he contacted our Swedish office and asked for sixteen holes. Or at least that's what we thought. And we okay. tried to explain Mats that okay, one course has actually eighteen holes, not sixteen. But then he <laughs> said, no, I need sixteen courses, not holes. And that was oh like my okay. Word. <laughs> we need to think about this a little bit closer. <laughs> and the reason why, note. yeah, I mean, we never got that kind of a contact before. But <laughs> the reason for 16 is that there is like, Oland Islands is divided into 16 communities. So they wanted to have one course per each community. Oh, so they can have okay. their own course. <clears throat> and that's why it's called, uh, that's why they came up with the number 16. All and Island, they already had uh, actually two courses, small ones before that. <clears throat> one in Marienham, which is their kind of a main city. And then one in the other a little further island. And the, the difficulty of this, or let's say the challenge for this was that they wanted them now. I mean, it was kind of a, in three months, we want to have as many courses as you can make. So... <laughs> Then we basically sent two to three of our designers there. Pasi Koivu, who is our main designer nowadays, he basically spent that whole summer in those islands just designing course after course. And uh, they are very unique. I mean, if you go there one of these days, you will find that they are kind of a fun to play nine to 12 to 18 whole courses. They are not like super difficult or very challenging, but they are more like that. If you are a disc golf tourist, that is the place to go. There are a lot of small breweries, nice restaurants, and you can go around the islands and play those courses in one week. And the whole idea of this was, of course, to bring some, you know, tourism. local tourism. I mean, tourism in Finland, especially during the pandemic, and then, of course, international tourists after that and 
of course, when we got involved this project, we wanted to make it as as good as possible and kind of a, make it like the world's biggest disc golf park in a way that we combine all these. And we haven't really get there yet, but I mean, Simon, Eagle, Paul, they all ha- have been in, invited to those islands and we plan to hopefully this summer to go there for a couple of days and experience the Orland Island experience. Amazing. That's so awesome. Simon, you, you're going to go this year, but you haven't been yet. I mean, what can you predict nowadays? Nothing really. So yeah. it's the plan right now. Yes. Yeah. That That's is so wonderful. cool. I, I hope to get there as well. So, and one more thing on the all in islands project, you p- recently posted a video with the guy, um, who I guess was the guy that contacted you. You said Mutz. Um, Mutz, yeah. I'm guessing was that him in the video? And he was kind of talking about the success since then, um, how many people it's brought in and mm-hmm. exactly what you were just saying about disc golf tourists. Like there, that is what disc golfers do. When we get bored of the courses in our area, we're like, okay, get some friends together let's road trip to some new courses and i'm so so happy that they see the the uh immediate value and they've already Mm -hmm. seen all these tourists so what have the numbers been like and are they have you talked with them after and are they happy with their decision to do the 16 courses yeah i mean all the communities in Holland are happy they they get their own disc of courses but but uh he is a data analyst in his normal work. So he kind of analyzes data for his work. So and he has built pretty interesting charge and data from, okay, how many people there have been. Of course, you can't really know exactly who there are, but at the same time, we we actually installed a live live counters on all of these courses. So there is actually a website that you can go and you can see that how many rounds there are played today on each of these courses so you can actually see a live count of how many you know rounds has been played today and that is also part of the digitalization of of disc golf that we want to actually know because you know on 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 ball golf a normal golf you have a tee times and every round is registered and they can count okay how many rounds you have played and every round cost money but in disc golf it doesn't cost money necessarily so nobody really knows how many rounds it's played of course we have these great right. apps like you know UDisc or metrics but our experience that less than 30% of people playing the course actually uses those apps so mm-hmm. they don't tell you the real number of players but if we have this infrared there is like a sensor that you walk between the hole one and two, everybody walks through this bridge and the, the sensor is in the bridge. So that will count every single person going there every day. So we have a website wow. that it's shows so that, okay, cool. wow. that and how many only... players. I'm sorry. Yeah, that was the first project was there. We put them in all and islands, but now it's expanding. So we have, we're actually at wow. Disco Park. We are offering these counters. So we, for example, we are counting at the moment that how many courses are played, how many rounds are played in Tampere area, because we have five courses in town. So I can see that in January, there is 922 rounds played in our courses. Wow. Amazing. That's so incredible. So, that data is so important too, to bring up to other cities or other, other people who are wanting to build their local courses in their area. So that's incredible that you're making that happen. So good on you. For yeah, that. we need, yeah. Very cool. And overall, the, of course, it has been quite a success. The the All and Island project. We we really doesn't know yet because we haven't we re- really seen the international travel there. But whenever the pandemic eases out, I'm pretty sure that we will see much more people from Central Europe, Sweden. Mm-hmm. And I mean, All and mm-hmm. Islands is middle of Sweden. Estonia and Finland and those are the three biggest countries in disc golf here in Europe. So cool. Wow. Yeah. Well, awesome. I'm I'm curious if for the people listening out there that are kind of like the heads of their league or they run the clubs in their city, what advice would you give them? You know, obviously contact Disc Golf Park, get them get them in contact with you, but let's say they 
are past the design part. How, or sorry, they're not to the design part yet. How did they, what advice would you give them to pitch it to their city that, hey, we need a disc golf course? Like, what would be your first step? I would say that I've actually studied quite a lot of this, how, you know, disc golf is growing in in US or how it was growing in Finland before we started the disc golf park concept. And one of the uh, challenges in my opinion is that when there there is this local person or a group of people who wants to get the disc golf course or disc golf in general in this area and they contact the city people they typically go in with their own presentations that they have made of course there are no like universal this is how disc golf works presentation yeah. of course you can always get that you know from different sources on online i think the risk comes here when you know just give you an example, probably this audience knows that, okay, if there is a 750 rated local guy who wants to make a disc golf course. And of course, he is basically, when they start to design it, that's the normal way that there is this group of people who wants to get the disc golf course. Then they go to the city people, they get some sort of a permission that, okay, you can put it in the back, back there. And typically that area is kind of a less used area, maybe a wooded area on the back back side of the town or whatever it is because disc golf is not really a prime location sport at the moment at least in many places so when they go to those woods and start to design the course for themselves basically so i have this theory that i've seen hundreds of disc, disc golf courses and i know who have designed them and typically it goes like this whatever your rating is that would be the scratch par on that course that that person is designing it because they basically they are not professional course designers not even professional disc golfers but they are very active you know players so they typically if if they are 700 800 rated player they will design 300 feet par threes or 400 feet par fours because that's what they can reach but a good designer can of course challenge that and they can kind of, if, if our people are designing the course, we can design a course that par gives you a thousand rated because we know what that means. Mm -hmm. That's kind of a one aspect. The other aspect is that safety. So those people might, you know, design a very cool across the street hole, but that is of course not safe, but it's cool to throw in a tournament setting, but they don't necessarily right. think about it that, okay, there are daily users who are playing this across the street or very close to the you know barbecue pit or whatever it is. So it's very important that whoever is going to design the course would understand the safety and what, because I mean, you as a professional player, you know that, okay, what, where the disc should go and where it typically goes. But right. when you have this average Joe or Jane, yeah. yeah, it can be wherever. I mean, especially in the windy, windy conditions, the disc can fly pretty much wherever mm -hmm. it, it is like that my best advice is that find a person who has already designed courses and know what what what, what he or she is doing because that is very important but are you saying even in just the talking to the to the community you think already that being the first step you think that they should already have a course designer ready in that moment or do you think they can go to the city, pitch an idea of a course, and then contact a disc golf park. Yeah, I mean, you don't need to have the course designer first, of course. You need to have an idea first, and then you need to have a land, and then you can have a designer. But I mean, just to give you an example, what if we want to have a, a new building for recreational, you know, sport? You need to have an architecture for the architect for the building. I mean, you, you you're not just if you play tennis you're not going to design a tennis court there are people who design those things so in the same thing in disc golf should be that you know there should be a designers for disc golf courses i don't believe that there is much golf courses that are designed by non-golfers or non-disc uh, golf course architects well, and going back to like that course design and Simon, your stamp of approval, what would you say is your criteria for like a good disc golf course? Like what would you say in your opinion? 
Very, very simple. I go by three steps. Number one, of course, safety. Safety always has to go first for any course to be acceptable, in my opinion. Uh, after that, for me, comes next fun. <laughs> that fun, maybe yes. a lot of other pros have different opinions. They want challenging before fun. I would like fun before challenging. Mm. And at the end, of course, we all want a challenge. We all want to go out there and test our skills. And a course that can provide that is obviously where I would want to go first. But yeah, safety fun, challenging. That's what would be my step. And that's definitely what I'm looking for when I go here, designing new courses or even a lot of redesign projects here, which is right. also a big part of uh, what I want to do is take courses that already exist because then you don't have to go through this whole process what Paige just mentioned of contacting the city, finding a new park or a woods or whatever it is. You take a course that could be so much better and just redesign the whole thing. And that feels then like a new disc golf course. Totally. That's actually a really, really good opinion. I love that. Do you have any plans in the works in the Boston area, Simon, where you're Non-stop. currently living? Nonstop. Yeah, it's, cool. it's literally when Avery is in town and uh, we have one project we're working on, let's say the new one in New Hampshire, where I did the Disc Golf Network project with. Um, literally every day, there's a new contact, phone calls, messages. People here that were in town were designing a course. And uh, every day, at least, I don't know, a handful of new contacts where, hey, I have this plot of land or, hey, I have a good contact to here. And uh, we could, if we had the time, we could put a new course in here every week. Wow. Amazing. Okay. So then my question to you, UC, about that is when you hear that, Simon, and I'm sure you contact UC and say, hey, man, wow, we got a lot of requests, right? So what is you have those 40 people about give or take on on contract do you think about then making that 80 people so you can fulfill all these requests that simon's getting and simon can kind of delegate like hey uh you're our northeast representation we got this request and push it over to him like you know what is your growth plan as far as the amount of people that are putting in courses for you well, that's a good question. Uh, I would say it's a case by case. We need to look at this. I mean, especially in the North America, we need more people, of course, for the demand. But same thing goes with in Finland and Sweden as well. Uh, but I would say that when there is this initial contact from, OK, we have an idea or let, we want to have a disc golf course, it's typically, you know, 12 to 24 months until it's a reality because there is budgeting things, there is permits and there is all kind of things between these contacts. And of course, whenever we have a contact, uh, they don't all come through. So I would say that there is a lot of contacting. And then, of course, you know, there are other other providers, too. And Disco Park, uh, we are like a, we are really proud to be like a concept. So we typically are a little more expensive than just to buy the equipment because we are also offering a lot of services and and. and other stuff that is coming with a good disc golf course and course design. So we really want to help uh, communities and customers who see the value of a new sports activity, not just a, you know, the play thing in the park that we tend to like make all the projects from start to finish. I mean, we offer the opening ceremonies and, and some media and all that kind of stuff for our customers. So I would say that we always want to grow slow in a way that hiring and, and recruiting new people and then offering them two or three projects a year doesn't really make sense. We want to, of course, fill our existing people calendars first. Mm -hmm. And and uh, But we, we don't know yet. I mean, the growth has been pretty intense in the last couple of years. So I'm expecting this to continue and we are hiring more people into this group so we can serve all the customers. Awesome. That's awesome. I have a question from a volunteer standpoint. I have actually had the pleasure of helping my brother. He has built two courses here in Canada, just on our local properties that we what, that we have. And I know how much work it goes into to maintaining those courses and to like, I don't know, just even just cleaning up the land and like the course maintenance in that regard and the physical regard. I'm just wondering, is there any way for like local league members or like community members to have a hand in that 
uh, course maintenance and uh, kind of that physical labor part of things? I can take this. Yes, absolutely. Uh, I mean, unlike many other sports, let's say that there is a, you know, new tennis court being built in, in your city. Typically, it's being built by a contractor, like not really a tennis club because, you know, it's a little different thing. Uh, but what I've learned in this golf is that whether you're in Finland, Sweden, Germany, or United States, the local community, I mean, players are very important part of the success of the, the new course buildup. I mean, they can help with the tee pads, they can help with the baskets and tee signs and clearing the course. Of course, we, you need to make sure that everything is done safely. So mm -hmm. it's pretty cool to see that the Actually, when there is a new course coming into the city or town, it actually gathers the active activity and, and community together. And mm -hmm. that will actually be a very good base and foundation for the for the course and, and activities around it. So uh, I would That's say cool. that yeah. we as a disco park, we don't have the resources to basically coordinate that stuff. But of course, we we're always there to help and say, hey, you should, you know, figure out if there are other like-minded people. Typically there is already a disc golf club or somebody mm -hmm. or some group mm -hmm. who is willing to do. And then it's pretty much, let's say if normally normal case is that the city kind of purchases the course and, and of course tells that, okay, this is the land area where it's going to be. Then we, as a designer, we are talking with the city mainly about all the, you know, budgeting and, and scheduling and build up and everything. And then, we might say, hey, there is actually a cl local club that could help in these kind of things. And then we connect the club and the city if that hasn't done before. But typically uh, there is, you know, these kind of things go like a wildfire on social media and local, you know, you know, messaging boards. So they will notice <laughs> later, sooner or later that, mm -hmm. okay, there's going to be a new disc golf course and they will actually contact the city and how we can help. That's how it typically goes i love that awesome it's awesome well i just want to give you guys your own floor right now and give you guys the mic basically is there anything else that we just haven't even thought of behind the scenes that happens that goes into the disc golf park scene that you guys are super proud of or that the the general public would be surprised to learn about like what else goes on that we don't know about that you guys want to share the most interesting part for me about uh, course design in disc golf is that I'm, I'm not convinced that disc golf has really found the perfect course yet or what is, what even is the ideal disc golf course? If, I mean, we always compare it to ball golf, of course, and if we look at a ball golf course, those are designed by obviously professionals and there's millions of millions of dollars that goes into each course like it's actually mind-blowing how expensive it is for a golf course and a disc golf course i mean it's a couple grand to put in a disc golf course which is insanely cheap especially for like a city um that put in all these things like tennis courts now pickleball is obviously super super popular playgrounds like the prices of those things going in are mind-blowing to me like stuff i never even thought of and a disc golf course is like Peanuts, like how, how we would say for that. So um, my question is, I don't know if Paige, you have a good idea or you see, like if someone gave you, let's say money does not matter, like what even would be the perfect disc golf course? If you, you get like, let's say $10 million and here's a plot of land, build the best disc golf course possible. Like in my brain, I think about this so much. How, what would I even make? What is the perfect disc golf course? And I think, and I hope in the next couple of years, we'll get much closer to that answer because that's one of the weak links in disc golf. I think that we haven't found the perfect playing field yet. Yeah. So for me, I mean, I think about the first, very, very first thing I think about is when the disc golf pro tour puts out their schedule or the majors, they put out their schedule. I think first and foremost, that where it is, is so important. Just the name of the city when it's, when it comes up and it says Burlington, Kentucky, or it says Clearwater, Minnesota, or Leicester, Massachusetts. Most people don't know where, where those places are. So 
you know, if you look, I'm, I'm a huge music fan, right? And so when I look at where the artists, the musicians are coming, it's always the biggest cities, you know, and that's like Prague, you know, Dallas, Chicago, it's always a big city. So for me, I think the budget needs to be raised so that we can get into areas that are more heavily populated so more people see it. I think, you know, Leicester is only, what, 30 minutes away from Boston, which is a huge city. But for us to be inside of Boston, I think that would be so, so huge. Um, I think back to when we when we played the Copenhagen Open, the maid there, and it felt like we were in the city. You know, you're looking up past the trees and you're seeing all the spires and the and the church steeples. And that felt epic to me. It felt like we were getting the most eyes on us. But now as far as the, the piece of land, I think it needs to be very visually pleasing, you know, for the cameras and for the players. We want, when we step foot on that course, we want to feel like it's an honor to be there. It's an honor just to play there. And um, like for the cameras, you wanna see like waves coming in you know we want to be on the coasts of california with waves and big trees and i think that we're on the right track with courses like tampere but i think um we want it to be a little bit more um it's tricky because you want it to be more well seen but you also want those tight woods so like you said simon i think we're we're still figuring that out, but those are the kinds of things that I'm thinking of when I'm thinking of the future of disc golf. I would probably add a little bit more complexity to this discussion. Uh, those are great points. And Simon said that, you know, disc golf, building a disc golf course is basically peanuts compared to the others. And when you page say that, okay, we're playing not in the big cities and we're playing in the more rural, rural areas, or place smaller places. I think it all comes down to the, you know, money in a way that, of course, if you want to have a disc golf course inside C Chicago or Boston city limits, that land is so valuable that it's impossible. I mean, I think that's a that's that's the impossible task. I mean, uh, unless we go and borrow the you know golf course because some of the golf courses are in those city limits. So in my world, in my perfect world, disc golf is actually like a recreational activity, not in the very city center, but of course nearby, like Leicester in, in, in Massachusetts. Sorry, my language. But the, 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 the question that I, I've been pondering quite a while and long time is that probably you and some of the audience will know or remember that the first disc of course ever was put out in Oak Grove in 1970s, probably 76 by Ed Hedrick and his son. And when they basically designed the disc of catching device called the disc pole hole, they put it to the local park and let it be there. So that was how the disc of was born as a, as a, as a disc of course. So now there was one place in the in earth where people can go and throw frisbees into it and it's totally free activity. So that's how we started. So we started as a free to play thing. So when something is free, it is really hard to get money out of that. If you follow what I mean. I mean, let's say putt putt golf or any other sporting good sport is basically pay to play so my question which is impossible to answer is that what if that first course 76 was actually a pay to play and everybody would have been taught that disc golf is pay to play just like bowling just like tennis just like golf just like any other sport I don't know if we would have 10,000 disc golf courses or maybe it has maybe it could have died because nobody wanted to pay for it but what if because also you know it could be that we would be now in the Chicago city limits in the nice pay to play course because it's actually a business so those are the big questions that we probably never will know but pay to play disc golf 
is one of the most important avenues that we should go, especially now when the you know players are player numbers are going very high and there is like so many new players coming in and these existing free to play courses are not nearly enough to accommodate these masses. I think that we should now take the step that okay, there is a better upgrade, better course, better service more safe environment, no other activities in here, and that's the pay-to-play disco. I, I, I truly believe that that needs to happen more than it's actually happening now. I mean, we have great, you know, great uh, examples like uh, Järva Disco Park in, in Stockholm. They started 1995 or 96 as a pay, pay-to-play course, and now they're one of the most famous courses and most, most busiest courses in the world. So th- that concept works. Definitely. And I like what you're saying about like adding the business element into it. And, and to me, it makes so much sense. And why not add in like a clubhouse or add in other ways where we can like, uh, use that revenue to make more disc golf courses and make them even better. Right. And just put all that money back into the courses back into disc golf. I think that is where disc golf's headed to, you know, Mm -hmm. you're seeing for you know, this year we saw at the OTB Open, we saw designated spectator areas. And in those areas was food trucks and beer carts. Yeah. And I see mm-hmm. that being the future and being pay to play because you're totally right. You see nothing, nothing is free anymore. And mm-hmm. it's already cheap enough, but then you kind of get that backlash from uh, the longtime players that say, hey, but it's always been free. Why are we changing? And, you know, I, I think you're right. We can't change that. We can't hypotheticize like what would have been and how disc golf would be now. But I think our step to really growing the sport is to make it a little bit more pay to play, even if that's just a couple dollars on the more recreational courses and then maybe up to $15 or something on a premier course. I think that's a huge step that we need to take. Um, I really appreciate y'all's perspectives and we really, really are so excited to hear more about Disc Golf Park and about getting more courses in. Um, We want to thank you for your time and thank you for showing us, you know, just what goes into a huge corporation like this. And I just want to applaud you guys for, you see, especially for not just running Disc Mania, but then for taking the step and starting a new company, Disc Golf Park, where yes, the same owner owns both of it, but I appreciate the fact that Disc Mania isn't posted everywhere. You just see that Disc Golf Park and it's just so classic and professional. Mm-hmm. And I think that you have uh, nailed it, absolutely nailed it. So congrats Definitely. on everything and thanks for joining us on Approachable. Yes, thank you so much for your time, both Simon and UC. It was awesome to talk to you both. Of course. Thank you, right. Joe and, and Discolfpark.com, right? Discolfpark.com. Yeah, please visit awesome. that. And I want to I want to end here in a, quickly that next time when you go to course, any course, take one extra disc with you and give that to someone. That's something that we can spread the sport and make it bigger and get somebody new into the sport. So everybody has one spare disc. Love it. I love that. And maybe even yeah. not to the course, because if they're already at the course, they already know. But maybe just bring yeah. one in your purse or your Anywhere. backpack or whatever. And just next time you go out to eat, just, hey, yeah. you play disc golf? Here you go. <laughs> love it. That's, that's awesome, good, you see. I love set. it. I love it. Thanks, okay, guys. guys okay. Thank you that's so awesome. much. Thank you. And we'll talk to you soon. Bye-bye. Wow, Joe, that was so... I love to hear about the radar part how cool was yes. that, that was i didn't insane. even know that that's like, something they should promote that because that's the first time i've should. ever heard of that and that I is agree. so cool like literally tracking every single person because i know i don't use udisc when i'm playing casual rounds i just go out there so for them exactly. to have tangible numbers to bring to companies to bring to cities that is so so cool and something that all course designers should take note on whether you come out with your own or you contract Disc Golf Park to use theirs, that is definitely, definitely very useful. So super, yeah. super cool. 
it's literally tracking their footsteps. Like it's tracking how many footsteps are going over that bridge or going over that sensor. I think that's incredible. Yeah, like, it is. Such and good it was data. it was just really cool to chat with them and to I mean, I've wanted to go to convention. I've seen their photos. I, I follow all of them on Instagram and uh, we'll put their handles in the description. But um, yeah, I've seen them going to conventions and I actually had the opportunity to go to a convention recently, but it got canceled with COVID. Um, but that's something I really want to do in 2022, just to kind of see that vibe that Simon's talking about and how professional it is. And then to show up as a disc golf player and yeah. be professional and say, hey, we, you know, maybe Simon was intimidated back in what he said, 2012. 2012 but, yeah. you know, now at this day and age, that is where disc golf is. And we do fit in at your conventions. And uh, just to kind of mingle and and uh, show people what all the markets are that we could uh, collaborate with. I know for me, totally. I'm going to go to the convention with Thunderbird Bars, which is one of Thunderbird Real Food Bars. It's one of my sponsors uh, that yeah. had nothing to do with disc golf. Actually, they are in like Whole Foods and places like that that make, you know, an kind of a, a real food bar, basically all these nutrients and stuff. But right. they asked me to go to a convention with them. And I thought, how cool would that be to kind of talk to the owners of smoothie companies and the owners of all these different uh, supplements and stuff like that? Because disc golf needs nutrition. You know, we are out there oh, yeah. busting our butts and we're hiking miles and we are going at it, you know, 40 plus weeks of the year. And that would be the perfect place to go say, hey, disc golf and your company would be perfect together, exchange business cards, show exactly. them some numbers like like you see saying. And yeah. I think the convention part was so fascinating for me to just picture pitch, pitching disc golf to all these people. There's so many companies that could get behind that. Everybody needs a mid-round snack. Like you get to hole nine and you're like, I am wasted. I need something accessible, <laughs> right? You're like, I think, I yeah. think wasted in, in America, wasted has a different, true. different term. Meaning, Maybe you but... want to say something else there. <laughs> true. I true. hope you're not wasted by hole nine. No, 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 <laughs> no, not at all. Like exhausted. I would say that. Yeah. There you go. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, I think you're totally right. We need we need more companies like that. And I know that from like word for word from the people at Thunderbird, like they actually set up on whole 10 of the Pro Tour events with their bars mm -hmm. and they got so many more um, impressions and stuff like that. And they were like, yeah. okay, we're all in. We're not just going to sponsor Paige Pierce. We're going to sponsor the whole tour. And exactly. that is what we're seeing with companies like Johnsonville and L.L. Bean mm -hmm. and all the other companies that stepped up for the Pro Tour Championship. So I think that's really cool. I think that um, my takeaway from this episode was, and I hope that you listeners and viewers, your takeaway is what you can do in your community to get disc golf courses in right is focus on safety focus on getting a hold of a course design company and let's go talk to the right people collect data points we saw that that was successful in the all end projects so collect data points go to the city have a have a thought in mind and what uc was talking about about the nobody's helping make tennis courts but everybody's helping make disc golf courses. We're doing exactly. work days, we're doing, you know, community cleanups. And so show, show the city, show the companies you're pitching it to some photos, some videos of the disc golf community hard at work. And I think that, you know, with the data and showing how dedicated we are, we are bound to get more and more courses in and, uh, if you want to do so and you don't want to do the legwork, I think you should definitely contact Disc Golf Park. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, it was it was really cool to see how approachable they were and exactly. how approachable Disc Golf can be to some random dude 
in some islands of in between Finland and Sweden. He says, hey, we want 16 courses. Bring them on. Not just 16 holes, mind you. 16 courses. Get that Pretty right. Pretty crazy. That is insane. Pretty crazy. What an so email cool. to get. Insane. Yeah, so... Thank you guys so much for joining us on another episode here. If you have any further questions for Simon, you see you want us to talk about something specific next week, anything, comment below if you're watching. And if you're listening, send us an email to approachable at jomezpro.com. Thank you guys so much for joining and we will see you on the next episode. Yes. Thank you again to Jomez Pro. And yes, we'll see you on the next one. Bye, guys.